Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome into this time where we might be one in Christ. We've been having a, a series this month that we're calling Putting Down Deep Roots, the core of resilient faith communities. We're celebrating that, that unity we find as we're centered in Christ. We're talking about ways that we share such great connection and find strength and encouragement through those connections. Today, we'll celebrate ways that, that we are committed and through our faith, we can be bold in the ways that we live it out. And next week, we'll talk about ways that we can live out our compassion as we know that the love that God revealed to us in Jesus Christ flows and works through us in amazing and, and ways that we can celebrate. So friends, welcome to worship. Please prepare your hearts during the plane of the prelude. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. 
To you, we lift up our eyes, you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, so our eyes look to our God, who has mercy upon us. We come together to worship you, O God. So the roots of our commitment to your mission will be strengthened and renewed. Would you join with me in our opening prayer? Holy God, we come together as your people, searching for sacred space, longing to be cherished, craving for real connection. In this hour of worship, let thankfulness sink deep and joy spring up. We lift our hearts and souls and minds to you, our creator, for we are wholly yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, children. Now, some of you, I've mentioned before in other settings that my son is a college baseball pitcher. Um, he's been pitching since he was in first or second grade um, in Little League Baseball, and he has always loved the game, and he loves being a pitcher. Now, there... When I think about baseball, nothing happens in the game. In fact, there is no game until the pitcher lets go of the baseball. Because until the pitcher lets go of the baseball, let's face it, especially if you've played, you know everybody's just standing around waiting because you can't do anything until the pitcher lets go of the baseball. So that makes me think a little bit about a uh, parable that Jesus tells. A parable is a sort of story. And in this story that Jesus tells, there is a rich person who gives really fancy gifts, riches, to three of the people that work for him. Now, two of the three people share those gifts with others, and one doesn't. One holds on and hides the gift. Now, in that story, the owner is upset with the third person who works for him for not sharing what he was given. Now, why? I guess two questions here. One is, why would he be mad? Well, kind of like in baseball, there is no game if the pitcher doesn't let go of the ball. With God, there is no good in the world unless we give and share what God has given to us with other people. 
And that's how goodness grows in the world. Now, knowing this, why would a person be scared? Why would a person not share? And the answer is they might be scared to do the wrong thing. I mean, let's talk about baseball again. And because I've seen this, I coached my son when he was young. There were times when he was little. And again, if you've played the game, you understand this. When you're standing on the pitcher's mound and you're looking at the batter and all the parents are sitting around the fence and they're all saying stuff, sometimes they're being saying it loudly, and your players are all staring at you, everybody's looking at you. That can be pretty scary. That can be really scary when everybody's looking at you. And it can be scary because you're so afraid of making a mistake with this ball. What if you throw it to the backstop? What if you throw it into the ground? You know, what if you hit the batter? You know, all these things start going through your mind as a pitcher and you get scared. And sometimes you don't want to do it. And so I would go out to my son and I'd get down on my knee. Now he's way taller than me now. Uh, but in those days I'd get down on my knee to see him face to face. And I would tell him, just throw it as hard as you can. I don't care where it goes. And I meant that. If he reared back and chucked it and hit the backstop, I'd say, yeah, good throw, blow it up, do it again. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing with us in that story. He's telling us, don't be afraid. Just let it go. Just let it go. And whatever happens is going to be fine. Whatever happens is going to be good. The point is, you share what you've been given by God. And I think that's a pretty important lesson for children of all ages, from 3 to 93. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all the things you have given us. And thank you for loving us every day. Help us to share the things you've given us and share the love that you've shown us with other people so that we can help them have better days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one, he gave five valuable coins, and to another, he gave two, and to another, he gave one. He gave to each servant according to that servant's ability. Then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. He gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more. But the servant who had received the one valuable coin dug a hole in the ground, and buried the master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five valuable coins came forward with five additional coins. He said, Master, you gave me five valuable coins. Look, I have gained five more. His master replied, excellent, you are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come celebrate with me. The second servant also came forward and said, master, you gave me two valuable coins. Look, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, you are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come celebrate with me. 
Now the one who had received one valuable coin came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid and I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here you have what's yours. His master replied, you evil and lazy servant. You knew that I harvest grain where I haven't sown and that I gather crops where I haven't spread seed. In that case, you should have turned my money over to the bankers so that when I returned, you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, take from him the valuable coin and give it to the one who has 10 coins. Those who have much will receive more and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even the little bit they have will be taken away from them. Now take the worthless servant and throw him out into the farthest darkness. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week, we are continuing our worship series on putting down deep roots, the core of a resilient faith community. Now, ordinarily, when I offer the message, um, I don't like to make it sound like a souped up Bible study. Um, but the passage that Chris just so beautifully read for us calls us in because it is both familiar and it is also troubling in certain ways. And I wanna talk about these different aspects um, as we work through this. It demands our attention. Now, like most parables, it begins with some hyperbole. We have a master who hands out coins in the passage that Chris read, and then goes away. Now, this is one instance where my preferred version of the Bible, the common English Bible, doesn't really do us justice. Um, because in the common English Bible, it uses the phrase valuable coins, where in the NRSV and other versions, they use the more traditional word talent. Now, a talent, is important to know was an enormous amount of money in the ancient world. Um, according to one source that I heard, um, a talent, a single talent, was the equivalent of 20 years of salary, 20 years of wages for the person receiving it. So even the final servant who only received a single talent was essentially getting a check for 20 years worth of his time. Now, I don't know about you, but if my boss gave me a 20 year check uh, tomorrow, I probably wouldn't work there anymore. <laughs> I'd probably find something else to do uh, with my time. So we are talking about a transformational amount. Now, are we talking about money? I think we all know, of course, we are not talking about money. This isn't Wall Street Jesus um, and telling us to invest and, and double our earnings. This is, that's not what this is about. So, but something else is being given then. And remember the important key is that it is transformational what is being given. And what's being given, I would argue, is an outpouring of love and joy. It is an invitation to participate in the boundless, infinite love of the divine. That is the gift. That is what these servants are being given. Now, another thing that I think we ought to point out is that this particular parable comes in a series of four different stories that Jesus tells back to back. And all of these stories take place before he and the apostles go to the garden where he awaits arrest. 
So this is right on the edge, right before his death and everything falls apart um, for his little troop. And there is a underlying message in all four of these. And in this one, it's very specifically called out. What will you do when I'm no longer here looking over your shoulder? How will you behave when it's you on your own? Jesus, I, Jesus, have given you, the apostles, this great gift of knowledge, of lo the knowledge of God's love, of the joy of being part of the divine kingdom, and an invitation to participate in that love. But when I'm gone, what are you going to do with that knowledge? What are you going to do with that love? Now, he does tell them in the parable, and this is also his metaphor for things that are to come in the future, the master returns after, quote, a long time. We don't know how long, we just know it's been a long time in the parable. And of course, we know the first two servants, they have faithfully worked with the gift that they were given and have doubled the bounty. And so it only grows. And that's another important insight, another idea that Jesus is offering us, that in the sharing, in the use of the love and the sharing of the love that we are given, we increase the amount of love, we increase the joy in the universe. That's a really important idea to hold on to because it explains why the third servant so troubles the master. The third servant, out of fear, buried the gift that he was given rather than use it. Now let's spend a little bit of time with that. Why would we be afraid? Why is the servant afraid? And by direct analogy, why would we be afraid to share God's love? Now, let's start with what sharing God's love means. There's a black feminist scholar named Bell Hooks um, who wrote about something, an idea that she had called the love ethic. And let me read uh, part of a passage from one of her writings. All the great social movements for freedom and justice in our society have promoted a love ethic. Concern for the collective good of our nation, city, our neighborhoods are rooted in the values of love that makes us all seek to nurture and protect that good. If all public policy was created in the spirit of love, we would not have to worry about unemployment, homelessness, or schools failing to teach our children. To live our lives based on the principles of a love ethic, which means showing care respect, knowledge, integrity, and the will to cooperate. We have to be courageous. Learning how to face our fears is one way we embrace love. Our fear may not go away, but it will not stand in the way. So let's think about that just for a moment. The question is not necessarily why we are afraid, but why are we afraid to act? What's stopping our ability to commit to a love ethic? Now, there could be a variety of reasons. One is the very human and understandable fear of failure. We don't act because we're afraid that our actions are not the right actions. And that's very closely related to something that I think we all do to ourselves from one time to another. We make the perfect, this ideal of what we should be doing or what should happen as a result of our actions. We make this perfect idea the enemy of the good. And so we fail to act. We don't act because we're afraid we're not being 
perfect. We can also despair. What difference can I make? This problem is so big. It's way beyond me. Why? I, I can't make a difference. And so in our despair, we fail to act. Or another way, another reason that we may not act is we think it is all on us. We have to be self-reliant and be able to see the clear path from beginning to end. And because we can't, because we can't see it all ourselves, we don't act. So there are a lot of reasons why we may not act. And in that inaction is, of course, the failure to commit to participating in this love ethic, in the love that we have been given by God. And it's our failure then to share that love and let that love increase in the world that results. And so this actually explains the banker statement, because this is one that sometimes confuses people if they kind of get the idea that Jesus isn't talking about money. But then he tells the servant who doesn't, who is, doesn't act, well, you should have just given it to a banker and at least it would have earned interest. Well, wait a minute, I thought we weren't talking about money. That sounds an awful lot like money. And what Jesus is saying, he doesn't, he makes it very clear in that parable that that would not have been an, an action that would have made the master angry. The master would have been fine if the servant had just simply handed it off to a banker. In other words, if for some reason we cannot act, find someone who can. There may be perfectly legitimate reasons that go beyond outside of fear for why we may not be able to act. Maybe we ourselves are in a situation um, where there are significant problems in our lives, health problems, financial problems, family problems, all sorts of things where the ability to act may not be there. But do we then pick up the phone and say, Pastor, you know, I need help. I can't take care of this obligation that I said I would do. Can we find someone else to pick that up? You know, do we call a friend and say, you know, I wanted to bring something over to a mutual friend of ours to help them out, but I just don't have the energy today to make that happen. Can you do it? And so in that way, we are sharing the gift of love that we have been given because we're asking for help. And there's frankly nothing more humble than asking for help. And so while we ourselves personally may not be the one doing the action, we're doing what we can to find someone who can, to find someone who is able. And so that's why the banker makes an appearance in this very complex parable. But now we get to the most troubling part of the entire thing, and that is the judgmental tone at the very end. The master severely rebukes the servant. The master casts the servant out of the household in the end. And because this is apocalyptic literature, it is hard not to see that as something about end times and final judgments and all of that. But again, I think a different idea, a subtly different idea is being communicated. You see, the servant out of their fear and their fearful inaction, rather than participating in the joy and love that had been so generously and transformationally given to the servant, chose instead to make a hell out of his heaven. He was invited into heaven and chose fear and exile instead. It is not the master who casts the servant out so much as it is the servant who chooses to stay outside of the love of God and not participate in that flow of love. And so yes, while the words are harsh, 
sometimes we need to hear a harsh message to understand that we do have a choice, but our choices come with consequences. And we don't need God to mete out the punishment because we're awfully, awfully good at punishing ourselves. In fact, it's one of the things we're probably best at is punishing ourselves when we don't do what we should do. And so what is the final message for all of us in this story? Jesus is inviting us to share in this love, to participate in a love ethic in the world. But doing that requires us to be bold, to be bold and overcome our fears, or at least overcome our fear of an action. It does require courage, as Bell Hooks calls, as Bell Hooks called it. I call it simply being bold. The fear is still there. And if there is no fear, then there is no courage, right? So courage, boldness, is what it is because there is fear in the background. So those fears may not go away. I may still be afraid I'm going to fail. I may still feel fear that I can't make a difference. I may still fear that my idea isn't the best idea or that our team's idea is not good enough or may not be good enough. I may still have all of those fears, but I act nonetheless. I persist nonetheless. And that is what we are called to do. We aren't called to be perfect. We aren't called to do it by ourselves. We have God on our side. And we are part of a universe of love. Will we share in that flow of love? And through our boldness, we become resilient because in our boldness, we are facing our fears and acting regardless. That is resilience. And that, friends, is where the roots go deep because they have been watered by love and we have accepted that nourishment into our roots. And the core of a resilient faith community is the boldness to act in the world when everything tells you, don't. God is the one saying, do. So my friends, as we think about what it means to be a resilient faith community, let's keep this parable in mind. The fear is there, and it is always there. But allow yourself to feel the transformation, to feel your own transformation in the love of God. You may be still be afraid, but don't be afraid to act. Be bold and share that love of God in the world. We have nothing to lose, friends, and the kingdom of God itself to gain. Amen. Today is the last call for some of our mission projects. First, if you have any leftover candy and you would like to donate that, the Knit and Crochet Group is collecting that to uh, make into small goodie bags that will go along with the Christmas gifts that we give to children. 
and Ray Rydell is going to explain how that will work in just a moment. Secondly, today is the last day for donations to our Thanksgiving basket program. We will adopt some families through Fremont Township and some of our deacons will go and shop and put together baskets so that some of our neighbors will be able to enjoy a better Thanksgiving this year. But again, we need those donations by today. Also, there's a coat drive uh, being sponsored through a connection with the Mundline schools. So students and families have been identified that are in need, and we can give them a brand new new, new coat for $20. So for the uh, Thanksgiving baskets, for the coat drive, we need uh, those donations by today, and you can do that with your offering or on the church website. Also, our new prayer partner program that Nancy Brothers uh, discussed last Sunday. If you'd like to be a part of that, we'd like you to sign up by uh, today. Tomorrow will be the deadline, and then we'll get those uh, assignments made and those connections, hopefully a way that we draw closer to God and to one another. Next Sunday, as part of our worship service, we will have a service of remembrance for all of our loved ones that we have lost over this past year. So if you have a name of a family member, a close friend that you would like included, please get that name to me by today, tomorrow at the latest, so that liturgy can be prepared for next Sunday. Our other uh, Christmas program for the night ministry. The, the sock drive is over, but we're doing the stocking drive. Those uh, will continue through December 6th, um, but if you'd like to um, come to the church to get a stocking to fill or bring those donations, you can do that at any time up until December 6th. So now the Christmas gift program for children will be explained by Ray Rydell. For many years, our church has purchased gifts for needy children at Avon Township. I think we have done this for about 40 years. This is one of the missions of our church that I think is very important. I have the list of children that need gifts. The 30 children on the list, varying in age from 1 to 12 years old, these children are among the most needy families that Avon Township works with. Many of these families are suffering more this year than normal due to COVID-19. As with everything else in our church, the process will be different this year than in the past. You will receive a copy of the Christmas want list via email on Tuesday. Beside each child's name will be a number. On Sunday, November 22nd at 11 o'clock, during our normal coffee egg time on Zoom, you have the opportunity to select the child you want to buy for. Just come into the Zoom session and we'll sign you up. Tell us you want, for example, number 14. We'll mark 14 on there and you have that person. If you do not want to use Zoom, you can call Connie or I and we will sign you up. If you're not available at that time, Give me a call and we will sign you up or you can have a friend sign you up. The list will have the child's name, age, sex, size, and things they want for Christmas. You do, need, you do not need to buy everything that's on the list. For that matter, you do not need to buy, you do not need to follow the list. The list is what they want or their parents said they want. However, knowing the family situation, the gift should be substantial, just as they have been in the past. If you want to, two members can go together to buy for a child. After you buy the gift or gifts, wrap them, put a name tag on the package with the child's name on it. Be careful of the spelling because some of the names are very similar. Do not fill in the from section. Let the parent decide when they, who they want the from section from. We're going to handle a gift coming into the church differently this, 
than we have in the past. We are not going to have the children bring the gifts to the altar as in the past, since the church is now going virtual. Connie and I will be at the church on Sunday, December 13th, from 1 to 3 to receive gifts, and on December 20th, from 11.30 to 2. You can drop the gifts off when you come out to the Caroline concert. If those times do not work for you, give me a call and I will meet you at the church at your convenience. We'll meet you at the back door, place the gifts in a black plastic bag so that you do not have to enter the building. We will provide easy curbside pickup. The reason we put them in, bla in plastic bags is first, it reduces the handling of items and working in close proximity, getting them ready to take to the township office. And secondly, when we deliver them to the township office, the parent can pick them up without their children seeing what is in the bags. I hope this makes all more comfortable regarding the virus by minimizing close contacts. It is very important that we receive your gifts at the church by the 20th of December, so we can deliver them to the township office on the 21st, and the parents can pick them up. If you have any questions, please give me a call. I know this is a new procedure for all of us. This is a great mission project, and I trust we'll do as well as we have in other years, even during this unusual time. The recipients, the recipients of the gifts are always extremely Thank you. Today is the third Sunday of the month, and it's been our tradition over the last few months to invite you to come for a carillon concert. So at noon, when our bells usually play some music, we have a, a theme around Thanksgiving for today. You'll hear about 10 minutes of those hymns being played by the carillon, and then you can tune your radio, and I will offer a, a short devotion and a prayer, and we hope that this is a time for us to have a, a shared experience, to celebrate our community connections, uh, the power of music that can bring unity and take a moment of, of being together, uh, for which I am profoundly grateful. And, I, and that's what I'd like to speak to, is the, the power of gratitude that can truly make a difference. As we turn our thoughts towards prayer, uh, lift up a few of our church members who were in the hospital this past week. I've spoken with uh, Gail Block and Patty Peterson. They're both home and doing well. Mac Pete is is about to come home. Uh, Rich Garling had a, a time where he spent overnight in the hospital, was not admitted, but was sent home. Unfortunately, he has contracted uh, the coronavirus. Um, it it manifested itself as as pneumonia. So uh, Rich uh, is well taken care of by Gail, who's a nurse, um, but I know they would appreciate your prayers. As uh, hopefully you got the message last Sunday uh, that Zelma Dunn has entered God's eternal care, we give thanks for all the ways that she shared her faith and love and generosity with this congregation. Um, she will be missed, but we give thanks for the love that she shared and the legacy that can continue through our congregation. Friends, let's be together in a spirit of prayer. We lift our eyes to the heavens, gracious God, seeking the mercy you so richly provide. When we are met in our daily efforts with scorn and contempt, you provide encouragement and acceptance. When there is only night around us, you come as the light. When it feels like destruction descends upon us, you provide peace and security this world cannot give. Let us live with you in the community of faith where we may learn to encourage and build one another up with love. You have blessed us, O oh God, with so many talents. Some we refuse to recognize, some we hoard and hide. We are afraid to use these talents, lest our efforts be judged inferior. We hesitate to employ our talents with all their creative potential, lest we call attention to ourselves. 
We look at others who seem to have been given so much more than we receive, and we are envious. Why, O oh God? Help us to equip ourselves with faith and love and the hope of salvation. Empower us to risk using the fullest of the gifts you entrust to us. Grant us the capacity to accept the efforts of others, to encourage them, to build them up, to rejoice at their success, and to share in their disappointments. Help us stay rooted, connected, committed, centered in Christ, and be bold in our actions. We seek to live in compassionate ways for the sake of your world, O oh God. We pray in Christ's name and with the prayer our Savior taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For all the ways that we live out our commitments to serve our living and loving God, we bring ourselves and these gifts to be dedicated to God's glory and service and sharing God's joyful love. Let us pray. For your goodness and generosity in giving us all we need, help us to praise you, O God. In every circumstance of life, help us to trust you in every thought and word and deed. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may we live for you. Amen. Beloved, as you head out into your week, please remember that you have been given so much by God. Please hold in your hearts the love that God has given you and share in that love ethic in the world. Participate in making this world a little bit better than how you found it. And in that way, we are bringing about the kingdom of God. In that way, because we have faced our fears, we are a resilient faith community with deep, deep roots. Amen. <laughs>